grace and peace of our faithful God be with you and always ever more so. Amen? Amen. We're going to, this morning, continue our uh, gospel series that we began, I believe, way back on uh, about January 1st or so. We're looking at the gospel of John, uh, which I've told you is uh, really, uh, if, I, if I dare say so, my, my favorite book in the Bible, and uh, maybe it's yours too, maybe it's becoming yours, I, I hope that it is. But I would ask you today to turn to chapter 9, we move from chapter 8 to chapter 9, and uh, we begin in verse 1, and I'll read today from verse 1 to verse 12. And so would you be attentive as you hear and as you read the words of God spoken to you today? As he went along, that is Jesus, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with his saliva, and put it onto the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word, Siloam, means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they demanded. He replied, The man they call Jesus made some mud, And put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man? They asked him. I don't know, he said. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. Uh, Father, we come uh, before you today, and we have the word, your word, presented to us. And, uh, Father, a story that many of us are very familiar with. And uh, I pray today that uh, you would, as it were, as, as you did give sight to the, to the blind man in the story, give us sight. Let us uh, have the ability to see. Uh, uh, give us that ability. Op- open our eyes and hearts to, to see your word, to, uh, to digest your word, and to be, to be moved by it, to even be shaken by it, and to be changed by it. Father... My prayer is that we not be the same people when we leave here as the people we were when we came. Father, shape us into the likeness of Jesus. Father, forgive me for the mistakes I'll make, and I pray you wipe them away from our our memories and our minds, that they would be forgotten, my mistakes, but everything that's good, that's in accord with your word, let all those things root down deeply in our hearts for the building of your kingdom. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, as we, uh, as we dive into this portion of John's Gospel, I want to just step back for a, a, a brief moment to consider, once again, because we want to rebase the overall purpose of the book of John. And we would find that purpose of the book of John, if anyone should ask you what's John all about, you could take them to chapter 20 and verses 30 and 31. And you would see and find the purpose of John's gospel. And it reads like this. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these, that is everything that's come before, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is a life-giving book meant to open our eyes to the reality that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of God, and he's coming coming 
to do all that God had promised. I do hope, as I said earlier, that this book of John becomes for you a, a treasure house, a treasure store that you would uh, store up the things of John and, and other Gospels, of course, but, but particularly John right now, that you would store up these things in your heart and mind and feed on them and be able to be, uh, uh, to be illuminated by them and, and allow, allow John's words, the words of God through John, to, to just sift into your life and give you life. Now, the text we have this morning is, is yet another series of, I've been calling them brush strokes. John is like an artist painting a portrait of Jesus. We've got yet today another series of magnificent brush strokes that John uses to convey the truth and the beauty of the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ. As we've done throughout this sermon series on the Gospel of John, we've, uh, we've tried to, to convey how all the different parts are interwoven and how they all connect together. I hope today to demonstrate again that not only we have truth and beauty in these 12 verses of John in 9, 1 to 12, but also we'll see even further the truth and beauty of how these particular verses connect with what has come before it and even what will come after it because it is all one big comprehensive story. John's portrait of Jesus. Now in chapter 8, we found Jesus present, presenting himself as the light of the world. He's been, that's been his topic. He's been telling everyone, I'm the light of the world. Uh, and for those who would believe him, they wouldn't be in darkness any longer. His, his teaching, he's saying, is truth. And if you're in my truth, you'll be set free by my truth. That's what the, that's what the light of the world does. It, it, it lets us see, it lets us be in truth, and it sets us free from lies and mistruths. Last week, as we concluded chapter 8, we took note that even as John is painting his portrait of Jesus, he's also been painting a portrait of humanity at the same time. And he does this through the exchanges that people have with Jesus. And so we're seeing over and over again that the Messiah has come to his own. He stands before them, the Word made flesh, his his plain speak about making the fulfillment of God come true, and yet he's being rejected. God made flesh, the Word made flesh, God, the God-man standing there, and even at the end of chapter 8, they're picking up stones. They're not picking them up to play hopscotch. They're picking up stones to hit him with and kill him. That is the picture we're getting of, of humanity here. So here you have the story as it currently stands. Jesus being presented as the Messiah, the Son of God, doing only the things that God could do, doing only the things and teaching only the things that God could teach. And then there is the rest of us doing what only we could do, rejecting him as he stands right there in front of our eyes. So we arrive today, beginning of chapter 9, and if we were reading this story without knowing the ending, we might wonder, given all that's happened up to this point, how might this Jesus react to this rejection that he's been given. How, how might this Jesus respond? What might he do next, given that people are even so much as picking up stones? Right? How, would, how would you react? How, we might wonder, how would he react? You, you might think angrily, bitterly, or you might want to run away. or That would be a natural reaction. Now, now how he responds is what we're going to find out today. How, and, and how he responds has unbelievable depth of meaning for you and for me today. We have to see his response, understand what it means for us in the church in 2014. That's our task. That's our task. John says as he went along, he saw, he saw a blind man, a man who was blind from birth. That, that was a, a condition, I think, that was much more common at that time than it is today, given our advances in medicine and our prenatal, postnatal care. I think we, we were better at that. So I think that was not an uncommon thing to find. And we know from verse 8 that he was blind and he was also a beggar. The only way that, that a blind person could make a living was to, was to beg. And so seeing that he was blind, Jesus' disciples says, they said, Rabbi, Master, Lord, well, who sinned? Was it him or was it his parents? How did this happen? Who sinned? You see, see, it was, it was a well-established teaching among the Jews, certainly then, 
that there was a definite cause and effect relationship between a physical affliction like blindness and sin. That, that if you were blind, something sinful had to have happened in order to, to cause that to have happened. That if a person was blind, either that person himself or herself sinned or their parents did. Uh, the Jew, now, in studying this, this past week, I came to learn that the Jews thought literally that, that a baby in the womb could literally sin in, inside the mother's room. That, that, was a, that was a teaching of the rabbis. Okay, So let me just dismiss that altogether. That's a superstitious hogwash. Just forget about that. But some, some of them thought that. And that's, that's why the disciples responded that way. Of course, they also asked about the parents. Because we do know about such a thing as generational sin, which is, which is true. You there? there are things that happen in a family, and I'll use the example of, say, alcoholism. Uh, when, when a father or mother are alcoholics, it's, it's been proven to show that there is a, a greater likelihood, not universal, not 100% by any means, but there's a greater likelihood that the children who were afflicted by that with their parents would themselves become alcoholics. Now, now if you were a, 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 a child of an alcoholic mother or father, I do not mean to say that you are doomed to that. You are not. You are not. No one is. But the statistics are, are clear that if you are in that environment, you're more likely to take it up yourself. And so, and as you do that, then, then your own children may as well. And so it's, it's a generational kind of a thing that, that needs to be, it's a stronghold of sin that needs to be broken. And uh, so, so, so the disciples thought, well, well maybe, maybe this blindness was one of those things. Maybe it was a, a stronghold of sin. But, uh, but I think they would be taking the idea of generational sin way overboard with that as well. This blindness was, was, a, was caused by sin, okay? But it was, as everything bad was and is, there, there's an ultimate cause to bad things. It's sin. The, it's the fall. It's the fall. We, we live in a broken world. Genesis 3, and until Christ comes back, we're going to be in that broken world, and things like cancer and disease and alcoholism and broken families and blindness, all those things have been happening and will continue to happen until, until he returns. All those things have been happening because of what we, our choice in the garden. So, there, so the answer is yes, it is due to sin, but not to a particular sin. Okay, so, so don't, don't misread uh, what's going on there, but the disciples don't know, don't know any better because they're being taught that by the rabbis. So, so Jesus says instead, he says, no, um, it was neither this man nor his parents who sinned. It wasn't, wasn't either. That doesn't mean that his parents weren't sinners. They were. You know, it doesn't mean he, they never sinned, but, but he's saying there's no cause and effect here. This happened, Jesus said, so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. That's why it happened. Now, now, don't take that to mean that God made that happen. That God didn't make that man blind in order to glorify himself. That's, that's not what he means either. That's not what Jesus means. God doesn't work that way. God doesn't cause you sorrow and pain in order to glorify himself. Now, he can work through, and that's, what Jesus, that's where Jesus is going to go. He can work through that pain. He can work through that affliction to be glorified. He can draw people into that man's life, which is what he's going to be doing, to show the glory of God. But God did not make that man blind. That is not what Jesus is saying. God does not work that way. Get that out of your minds. He doesn't. But he can work through that. And in fact, Jesus is going to do just that very thing. The broader point Jesus makes is this. We live in a broken world. It's full of broken people. And all those breaks, all that brokenness, are not mistakes waiting to have blame assigned to them. But rather, they are miracles that are yet to happen. Now, that, that may sound kind of fluffy for, for me. You know, my theology is, not, is, not, is more hard than it is soft. But, I, but he's not saying, we need to go out and assign blame for the sin that happened. We, we know ultimately where it came from. But, but I'm going to, to show that God can work even through this to be glorified. I'm, gonna look for, I'm not going to look backward to pain and cause going to look forward to what can happen and what can be. My ministry is a forward-looking ministry, not a backward-looking ministry. I'm going to show you how that works. And there's an urgency to doing it right now. He says in verse 4 and 5, he says, look, he said, as long as it's day, we must do the work 
of him who sent me. Now, not tomorrow, not at the end of the age, now. It's night time. It's daylight now. Night is coming when no one can work. That time will come when you, your hands will be tied and you won't be able to, to bring ministry. You won't be able to do it anymore. But now it's, it's light. I'm in the world, so let's work together now. God has sent me, he said, but, but look what he does. He says, but it's our work to do. He, he, he includes his disciples and says, it's our work. And so therefore, he's including the church in his work. It's then your work and my work as well to go out and minister to those who need to be ministered to. It's the call of Christ. He is with us now, the urgent call made. He's shining very brightly. He's exposing the darkness of the world to his light. They signal to us, Jesus' words, that there is darkness abounding. And this is where it all ties together to chapter 8 and what came before us. We have, we have a blind man who I'll suggest is symbolic at least, figurative at least, for the blindness of the Jewish people who were there waiting for their Messiah, who was standing right in front of their faces, and they could not see him. Not only that, but they, they even wanted to, to kill him. They despised him because he didn't look like them. And so here's the, here's the key. Here's the big take-home for today. We asked the question, how would this Jesus respond to a people who rejected him to the extreme? How would this man respond, react to a people who wanted to stone him to death? What does he do? What is his answer? His answer is grace. That's his answer. His answer is grace. He says, I, I, I see, I, look who he sees. He sees, the, ma the master sees a blind man. He sees one that everyone passes by. No one pays attention to. No one ever gives a second thought to. But who sees? Jesus sees him. He sees you. He can see, and he has grace. This man did nothing whatsoever to deserve to be healed. Nothing. He didn't ask for it. He didn't do good deeds. He wasn't of the right bloodline. Nothing whatsoever to his name. Nothing. But Jesus said, I will do this thing. It is by me. It is by grace. That's the response of God. It's a beautiful response. So what does he do? He spits on the ground. He, he makes some, some mud with the saliva. He puts, he puts the mud on the, the man's eyes. Now, there, there are all sorts of things we can think about. What, the, what does the mud mean and what does the saliva mean? There's all sorts of explanations. Uh, a couple might be, you know, back to Genesis, God formed man from the dust of the earth. He, he breathed life into his nostrils. And so, so maybe, maybe we have Jesus recreating, if you will, taking dust and adding, adding his own saliva to it and, and showing that that's going to heal. Now, maybe it's just showing double blindness. Maybe it's saying, the man's blind and I'm putting mud on his eye. He's really blind now and, and he's only going to be able to see when he obeys what I have to say. Maybe it was like Elijah. Remember when Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel? We know Mount Carmel. And he, he, he went to the priests of Baal, and they had the, the showdown, and he was going to light a fire, and he, he poured water all over the altar, and God still came down with a flame and, and burst it. Maybe it's a way of showing double blindness. This man's really, really blind. Guess what? He's going to see now. Go, go down to the, to the pool of Siloam, he says. And, and John tells us, Siloam means scent. Is what, Siloam means scent. Who, who's telling him to go? The, the sent one. The sent one. Jesus is telling him to go. The, the, Siloam was that pool that we read about in the Feast of Tabernacles. The, the, remember the, the water the water ritual we talked about a few weeks ago? That, that's the pool that came out from under the temple. It was, it was symbolic of the streams that were running from God, living water, to the people. Now, now it just so happens, you, you may not know this, in Isaiah, Isaiah 8, 6, he talks about the disobedience of the people, of the Jews, and he, he puts it this way. The, these people rejected, they rejected Siloam, is what they did. Look at, look at Isaiah 8, 6 today when you go home. They, they rejected Siloam because they were making a, a, an alliance with the Assyrian king at that time. They were rejecting God's rule and trying to make 
footsies with, with the Assyrian king. It led to ultimate disaster, but Isaiah said they rejected, so they rejected God. They rejected the one who's being sent. And just as the Jews at this time with Jesus were rejecting him, yet he sends this one blind, undeserving, to the pool to be washed and be able to have his eyes open, to have his sight removed. Jews couldn't see Jesus. They were spiritually blind. This blind man certainly couldn't see Jesus. The only thing he could do was to obey what Jesus told him to do. He had to go to the water in order to see. And I think, I believe there's something very special about the whole imagery of water here. I want you to follow with me back again to John if you look at chapter 5, you can look at that later on today, we see in chapter 5, near the beginning, the Jews seeking to kill Christ again because he made himself equal with God. And his response was this, go search the scriptures and go find out. They didn't know, they refused to learn their scriptures. He said, go search your scriptures, okay? Then again, in chapter 10, we'll get to that in a couple weeks, they took up stones again to kill him once more. Because they said, you're only a man, you're making yourself to be a god. And his reply was, is it not written? Is it not in your scriptures that this should happen? He is always pointing them toward water, toward the thing that would open their eyes. He's pointing them toward their own scripture. I think he's pointing us to scripture too. He wants us to say, open, open your scriptures and, and have eyes to see the truth and beauty of the God that is. And the God who sent his son to go to the cross to die and fulfill all things. Go to the scriptures and see. Have your eyes open by opening your books and see. Maybe even for the first time, but see. It's an invitation that's open to you today. So symbolically, at least, he's pointing to the Jews, to the water that can open their eyes. The word of God sheds light in the darkness. The water of scripture makes clear, gives clear sight even as the man washes his face to obtain his sight. The Jews, you see, thought they could already see. They thought they had, every, they had it all figured out. We got it all answered. We don't need you. Don't need it. Don't want to hear it. Don't want to talk, don't talk about my sins. I'm from Abraham, don't you know? I'm a child of Abraham. Who are you? They, they thought they knew. Here's the, the beggar didn't know. He couldn't know. He couldn't see Jesus. He had no idea. He had nothing to stand on. But Jesus came and spoke grace to him, and he led him to the water. So the man gets his sight back. He returns home, and he's able to see. And you look at the reaction of his neighbors. Some said, isn't, isn't that the man who used to beg on the street? Isn't that the one who was blind? And some say, yeah, it was. Some say, oh, no, it's not him. It just looks like him. It just looks like him. And, and, and finally, the guy says, no, it, it's me. It's me. You know, it's, it's a funny thing. Here, here's a guy, he, he, he does look the same. I'm sure from the outside he looked the same. But there was something different about him. Something they couldn't quite put their finger on. I wonder if any of you have had that in your life. If, if someone has ever seen you. And, uh, but there's something different about you that day. Some, some light that's maybe come into your life. Maybe the word's been opened to your eyes. Maybe, maybe you've got new life. And maybe you look the same on the outside, but there's something new going on on the inside. I, I can't describe it, they'll say, but you're, you're different. And, uh, and, it, and it looks good. Well, well, that's good for a while, but then after, after a while, what will happen is people will start to say, hey, you must be one of those Jesus freaks, aren't you? I, I, don't, I don't think that's too much for me. And then they'll, they'll start to talk about you, and you'll start to get jabbed and all. But, but something, def something changes. Something definitely changes. Just like it changes. And the people around you will see it. If someone has said to you, I see a difference, praise God. You may, I don't know why God took so long to save me. I don't know why. Why did he pluck me out of a midlife thing to do the thing that he asked me to do? I have no idea. It wasn't my plan. I can't explain it. But yet he did. He, d he did. And so, like the man said, they asked him, where's Jesus? He said, I don't know. Why did he do this? I don't know. You don't know either. It's grace. 
And you, you can't understand. You, you can't equate with grace. You can't pay for grace. It's not equitive. It just, it just happens. He does it. It's his business. It's his essence. It's his spirit. The difference this man had was Jesus. It's the difference that he gives to us. Your fear now turned into anticipation. Your disillusionment now turned into joy. The habits that bound you before are now turned to freedom of choice in your life. Your bad luck, your bad circumstances, the bad deal that you got when you were a kid growing up now turned into fresh opportunity. Now you can see life differently. Your pride, your self-reliance turned to humility and repentance. Your desire to stay tucked away, safe in your cozy little lair now turned into a desire to go out and serve and be bold for the Lord. The man simply said, yes, I am that same man. But how did this happen? They wanted to know how. And it's here where the, the words that the man gives are so simple, so wonderful. He said, the man named Jesus put mud on my eyes, told me to go and wash, and now I see. I went, I washed, I see. No one could say a thing about it. Because there he was, standing and seeing. No dispute. So the question for us is, can, can we stand? Can we stand changed? Can we stand seeing, able to say that it's been the Lord in me that's made? Can we say that? Can we stand and do that? Has there been a change in your life? Have people seen it? Have they borne witness to it? And have you told them that it's about Jesus Christ? Have you been the witness to the Lord? The way, the simple way that this blind man was a witness to the Lord. If you would love to see, if you just want so much to see, you have to prepare to admit your own blindness. It must start there. The Jews couldn't see him because they already had the answers. But I hearken you back to Matthew 5. We studied the Beatitudes two years ago in depth and detail. And they come in order for a purpose. The first one is, blessed is the person who was poor in spirit. That means, bless the one who is broken down and knows that they have nothing to bring to the table. they got nothing whatsoever. They are bankrupt morally, spiritually. They have nothing to give. Blessed is that one, because then they can see and start to mourn. Blessed are those who mourn their sickness, because they're now going to be filled with the Spirit. But first, you have to admit your brokenness. And once you do that and humble yourself to that, God works and he brings his grace and he fills you again. He allows us to see. He allows us to see. That's the gift of his word. Grace. We even celebrate today at the table an enacted word, if you will. We can physically participate in. We can see the invitation that Christ makes to us to be with him at his table. Even sinners like me and like you. He makes whole, not because of the good fellow I've become, but because of what he's done in me. It is by grace you have been saved, and this by faith, not by works, so that no man can boast. It is all Jesus Christ. Christ, and you're invited to his table to dine with him even today. On that night, when he was betrayed by one of his own who had been blinded, unable to see, even then he responded in grace. It's always been grace. And in grace he said, this is my body, which is broken and given for you. Take this, all of you, and eat it as long as you do in remembrance of me. Remember me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and pouring said, This is the blood of the new covenant shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of this as often as you do in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, this bread of grace, this cup of grace, you do show forth the Lord's death until he comes again 
to make all things right. And that day will indeed come with power. So would you come and uh, dine at the table of the Lord? We celebrate an open table here at Mount Carmel. We do ask that you be a baptized believer. But if you have small children, you would uh, not allow them to come forward without knowing the magnitude of what we do here today. If you need gluten-free bread, please tell your usher, and they'll bring that to your seat. If you just prefer to take communion at your seats, please remain, and the usher will come and bring you the elements of the cup and the bread. But come one, come all, to the table of grace, and see. Come and see.